Here's Eric Martin with Paul F. Tompkins and Paget Brewster. You guys do a program, and it's both thrilling and adventurous. Tell us about that program. Well, kind of hit it right on the head. It's the Thrilling Adventure Hour. It's written and produced by uh, Ben Acker and Ben Blacker. And Paget and I have been with the show since the very beginning. Six and a half years we've been doing it. We started out doing it in Hollywood at the M Bar mm-hmm. on stage, which was a supper club. Yes. So it was dinner theater. Yeah, yeah. We were all packed on a tiny little stage. Yep. And, and it we, was still the same cast. So was, there would be 14 people on stage at a time and yes. the orchestra. That's, that's right. That is true. The show has only gotten bigger and bigger as it's gone on, added more and more people. And eventually we outgrew that stage and we had to go to a larger stage. But uh, it was those were heady days in the early times when uh, the crowd would be completely drunk. And, and eating and clattering. Eating and clattering. People that front part of the show... Uh, those actors would go out and they would watch everyone eat. And then uh, we'd cut to get to come on the by last. the time everybody was feeling great. And Hence, yeah. we are fan favorites. Exactly, exactly. It's just built in. Yeah, because that's, bu- that's when the buzz started to hit everyone. Yeah, everyone yeah. thought we were yeah, great. Yeah. It's a sort of it's a, a transference, I think. Right? That's what they call it in psychology. I thought it was Pavlovian. Can it be both? I suppose. I just want to sound smart. I don't even know if I'm saying Pavlovian correctly. Yes, you do. I'm not entirely sure. Don't, what are you, the Barbie that thinks math is hard? Am I as hot as Barbie? Does that, <laughs> <laughs> but math is hard. I, I understand no, what all, the fury of was about. Barbie shouldn't be saying math is hard, but math like, is hard. Yes, I would like the listeners to go look that up. There was a talking Barbie doll that said years math ago? is hard. Math yeah. is hard. Oh my hard. God, 20 years ago. Was it? I remember the I big flap. Not. I remember the I, big of deal. Of course, we all, we all remember where we were. Math is hard. And so there you are. Oh, you're still here. Oh, (laughs) Oh, my heavens. He surprised me. I thought you'd let yourself out. In the shadows. Why is it so dark over there? We rely on public money, and that's what happens. But it's the aughts, and there you are in the supper club, and it's a kind of Stockholm syndrome in that they are drunk, your characters are drunk, there's an identification Identifying with you as the captors. Yeah, we the cast was, uh, Padgett and I are sort of Symbionese Liberation Army of Entertainment. (laughs) And the audience was so many Patricia Hearsts. Yes. But what brought you there? How did you get in that club? How did, how did this all begin? Well, I had known Ben Acker from um, when we both worked together in a nightclub called Largo, when it was, uh, it was a nightclub on Fairfax Avenue before it be moved to the theater space that it's in now. And so Ben and I became friends there, and then he started doing the show and uh, asked me if I would participate. And he knew... Padgett, I think, from Largo as well, because you've done my show. Yeah, I've done your show. That's how I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So obviously Ben thought we were great and had to convince his partner, Ben Blacker, that we were great. And then we had to convince ourselves that we were great, I think. Didn't take long. We're pretty good. No, no. It was a very (laughs) big discussion. I think it went, we're great, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. (laughs) I think that was show two. That was an excellent recreation of that moment in our history. Six and a half years ago. You really took us there. So that sorted out. You've moved on. <laughs> I'll say. And it moves forward. The show goes on. Yes. As the show does. As life does. Obla D and all that. You've been doing this for six and a half years. What's the best part about it? Oh, I, the best part is I love doing this character with Paget. It is one of my favorite things that I've ever done in all my career. And I look forward to it every single month. It is a absolutely a highlight of my professional career is getting to do this show every month. Well, it's the only time I go in front of an audience. I, I love that. No, I love Paul the most, obviously. But I'm a little, I'll tell you, I'm a little angry with Paul today. Because he doesn't tell me when he's out of town. And then I find out that I'm there, and I don't have Frank. And I do a show without Frank, and it's not the same. It's not, you're a great writer, Ben. It's great. You guys, the, you write great. But the audience, oh, God. The, tell, tell ben, before the curtain ben, opens, ben, they're ben clapping and clapping. Oh, and it, beyond belief. And they're so excited. Oh, we're going to see Frank and Sadie. And the curtain opens and it's just me. And it's the same <laughs> sound as like a hundred paparazzi lift their cameras up and look at you and put them down. Everyone knows that. That sound. whole audience. Of course people know that sound. <laughs> it's scarring. It's scarring. I know that well, sound. No, it is. It, I love doing the show with Paul. I love, I mean, doing the show is, is incredibly rewarding and exciting and terrifying. And mm-hmm. We rehearse the show. We read through it a few times. But there's only one chance to do it in front of the audience. Mm-hmm. It's a, and it's got to happen, you know. Personally, I have gotten better about little mistakes, stumbling over words and things like that. Like if that happens to not 
get so that, oh because inside you'll start spinning out in your brain about yeah, oh what yeah, did yeah, I do yeah. and then or now you're behind even afterwards no that's not, what I'm like, saying I know because yeah. now you still have more lines and you're thinking about no no I mean like I meant afterwards like after the oh, show after the show to not like you know revisit it again and again and say oh, oh I wish I hadn't I screwed up that one joke you know I see what you because mean, it's yeah. the nature it's the nature of it and I'm sure it happened in, in the actual days of radio dramas I'm oh sure, sure. screwed up words yeah they, everybody was drunk. And practically illiterate. <laughs> I fuck things up all the time. Whoa. <gasps> oh, they're swearing on the Oh, thing. fuck. <laughs> do you find yourself moved by the... Do you find yourself becoming more Sadie-like? I've certainly started drinking more in the last six and a half years than I did before. So. Because of this show? Yeah, because of the show. <laughs> no? Because of the talk about drinking <laughs> yeah, it's, in this radio it's, play? It's profoundly affected me. Look, I'm method. I'm like Dustin Hoffman. Why don't Why you, do you just think try I, acting, dear girl? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Look that one up, too. After you're done looking up Barbie. No, I know what that one is. I'm no, in the I middle know. of you, it right I'm now. Oh, you. oh, okay, okay. Oh, I thought you were, <laughs> so you were telling Obviously me to look you it got up. It. I know what it is. <laughs> Question, go. <laughs> so, Paul, um, you know. <laughs> no, I yeah? hear you. I hear yeah. you. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's like that. So... Frank Doyle, he's um, he's a, a rap scallion. Rap scallion, yeah. Oh, you were gonna say that. Um, you go on. Yeah, <laughs> Frank is a uh, is a very fun character to play. And the thing, oh. I think, the thing that I love so much about about Frank and Sadie is how devoted they are to each other, and they're always a team against everybody else. And that does not seem to be inherently comedic, but it's such a different avenue for comedy of like this totally united front that clearly disdained the rest of the world, you know, and, (laughs) and right. I mean, like everybody else is just ridiculous idiots and we know how to live. And it's, it's a refreshing take, I think on a, on a married team that they're totally on each other's side in all things. As silly as the show is, I think it's very sweet and it's kind of touching. I would totally agree. It's, it's nice to see that. It's nice to see you guys getting along. You, (laughs) (laughs) I know this has been hardest on you. I hate it when you fight. I know. <laughs> you guys have taken an incredible journey, and your radio listeners have gone along for the ride. Any final thoughts? Uh, yes, I am dead. That will be your final thought. Is that what we were not doing? Not right now. Oh, not right now. Are we guessing what our final thought will be? Or I, that's do you what mean I about, the game Yeah, was. I am dead. I am dead, yeah. Yeah, mine would be, this was obviously a mistake. You wouldn't even get to finish no, it. No, because then I'd be dead. Oh, cruel fate. That's what I'm afraid of. Do you have any final thoughts, darling? Oh, nice of you to turn I turned around. Australian at the end there, though. I'm with a bad Sadie. Hello? Hello? I do have a final thought. That's it, Matt, please. Oh, good. That was a shout out to Matt Gorley's Australian <laughs> robot. My thought was this. I realized I had another question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you guys ever really for real seen a ghost? No. I'll tell you why. Because there isn't any. Aren't any. That was terrible grammar. And Do you that's know what not comedy like does? Oh, you're right. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I heard footsteps once. <laughs> in your life? No, in a house. Oh. It, but it was in my that's, life. I was in oh. the house alone, and I heard footsteps upstairs. And I hid under the couch with my dad's bullwhip. My dad was a bullwhipper at Harvard. So he had the bullwhips in what the living room. What the fudge are you Apparently talking about? Apparently in the late 60s, you could bullwhip as a sport. And so my dad did six Oh, you know foot, what else you can do? Foot. You can lie to your children. <laughs> <laughs> A pool whipper at Harvard. <laughs> High end, low end. I don't know. What? what? I don't know. High end, low end. Well, he was trying to be a badass, I guess. He had a motorcycle then, too. But you're right. Maybe it was all lies. But I heard footsteps in the house. And I hid with the da- my dad's bull whip under the couch. Do you think it was a Nazi looking for the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> you know, one person can't carry the Ark of the Covenant by himself. That would have been two Nazis. That's a good point. But a ghost could, probably. With its ghost strength. You really? Come on. No ghostly nothing? Nothing? No. Never, never. even heard footsteps no, or a never. cold chill? Or, never. Have you? I mean, I thought I... No. Give it to us straight. <laughs> I was trying to fish for something, but I haven't seen shit. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Do you know people who have who claim to have seen ghosts? Absolutely. Yeah, people that are adamant about it. They Do know you they believe exist. them? I believe that they believe it. I mean, I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming most people. Because now we have to have a phrase like, I believe that they believe it. For years, I wanted, I thought the best thing you could ever have, and when I lived alone in New York City and I was very, very scared of being attacked, mm-hmm. the best thing you could have would be a ghost in your apartment that you could make a deal with. Like, hey, whatever you need. Do you want, you want books? You want to watch certain TV shows? But if someone breaks in, you scare the bejesus out of them. That right. would be the best home defense system. You don't yes. see the value in a ghost? No, I just I would do your bidding. I see the I tell I tell you what, I do see the value in a ghost that you can reason with and make deals with for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I think it's asking a lot that first of all there are ghosts. Secondly, they're willing to come to the table and hear your <laughs> and offers. Negotiate. Right. Yeah. Can they simultaneously haunt and be reasonable? <laughs> exactly. What's he doing there in the first place? Or she mustn't be sexist against ghosts. <laughs> well, I heard I have have heard that if you think you are being haunted, yes. W- what you do is you say to the ghost, "How can I help you?" And that by saying, "How can I help you?" you validate them as existing and then whoosh, they move on. Now, I heard if there's something strange in your neighborhood, there's someone you're supposed to call. <laughs> But it, it escapes me now. Yeah, who are you going to call? Whom are you going to call? I have one final question. Yes. How does busting make you feel? Uh, well, it makes me feel good. Paul F. Tompkins, Paget Brewster, thank you so much for being on the program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It's all things you're considered. I'm Melissa Block. And I'm Robert Siegel. Joining us here is the toast of the upper crust, a couple known in the society pages as well as in occult circles, Frank and Sadie Doyle. Frank, Sadie, thank you so much for being on the program. Charmed, I'm assuming. You have a lovely studio, darling. Well, not half as lovely as you, my dear. No, Frank, no, of course not. Why, it's hardly a comparison. I should think not. Now, not only do you two see the the upper crust, the the aristocracy, uh, with some regularity, but you're also unusual in that you see spirits as well, yes? Ah, spirits. The worst. Dreary company, nearly everyone. They all have some unfinished business, don't they? Oh, help me. Won't you help me perform one last task that I may get on with my afterlife? Oh, please help me. You're the only one that can see me. Do not broach that argument with us, spirits. That same logic suggests that merely because we're the only ones with a car, we must drive everyone in the city to the airport. The very idea. It is a favor reserved only for the very best of friends. Sorry, ghosts. Find your own way to the airport. When did you first start to see creatures uh, from the supernatural, and what were they? Well, mine was a nightmare clown, quite unlike those you would find in a circus. He lived in a well and devoured local children. I do not like to talk about it, so I thank you most insincerely for bringing it up. You're very welcome. Mrs. Doyle, what was your first encounter with the uncanny? When I was little, I would visit my grandparents, lovely people. The two of them would read me bedtime stories, and it was my favorite thing in the whole world, and theirs. In their youth, they were renowned thespians. Granddad was knighted. Their last roles were of a farmer and an unruly pig, or a panicked chicken and a conniving fox for an audience of me. Then when I was eight or nine, instead of going to their house to see them, they would come and visit me and read me off to sleep. I didn't realize they were dead until years later. Darling, I never knew that about your grandparents. I'll introduce you sometime. That's fascinating. Now, tell me, Frank, what, what's your story? Hmm, vague question. I grew up in a small main town. Some chums and I invented mystery and adventure wherever we could, until we encountered that clown monster I wish you would stop making me mention. I left town directly after. To where did I go, dear? You sought sanctuary, darling. That's right. My time with the church. They saw in me a prime candidate in the exorcism field. I learned what I could about holding my liquor and rolling up a newspaper and spanking ghosts who misbehaved. And eventually I tired of the church's dogma and I struck out on my own. And then what? Well, Sadie, you know this story. But I love it. (laughs) My Frank, it is most rugged. Mm. Well, I fell in with some like-minded people. Heavy hitters in the supernatural community. Sure. The hard-boiled pterodactyl Jones, so-called due to his traveling companion, the ghost. A pterodactyl! Yes, Harvey. And Red Wolf Mendels! Red Wolf was a second-generation rabbi and fifth-generation shaman. The four of them fearlessly cut a swath through the nastiest of the spooky and vice versa. We made a bit of a name for ourselves in certain circles. 
I must say we felt invincible. I must also say that it turns out we were not. It was a dark time when the gang split. I spent a year or two drinking myself into a stupor and picking fights with more ghosts than deserved it, if I'm honest. The dark time ended when I met this one. The best thing that's ever happened to me. It was love at first sight. Then I took a second look at her. And guess what? Even more love. And more with every look then to now. Oh, Frank. That is so heartwarming. Uh, Sadie, now tell us about your background. Nothing nearly as dour nor compelling as Mr. Doyle, I assure you. I have a sister, Lucy. We have parents. Daddy was a banker. No, that's not right. Uh, what is it when you own the bank? Anyway, growing up, I split time between London and Connecticut. Boarding schools, university. The most you could say is that I dated dangerously, I suppose. But who didn't, darling? <laughs> and how did you two meet? I was seeing a boy named Bobo. He wanted nothing more than to be a Frank Doyle or a Red Wolf Mendels or Pterodactyl Jones. He ran a mummy trafficking organization, as I recall. I found that out later. I, I hadn't known it at the time. Mm. Bobo had been holding phony seances for some trust fund kids looking for a thrill. He brought Sadie to one, and her natural sensitivity turned a fraudulent seance into a real affair. A particularly nasty specter came through and needed me to put its lights out. I dare say Frank cut a dashing figure, mysterious and powerful, whilst most were running about hysterically. You weren't running about. I believe I forgot to. You were lovely in the candlelight. You pushed that spectre back into the Ouija board from whence it came. And you said thank you, and that was it for me. And I was already a goner. Naught was left but for me to throw Bobo over for you. Which you did directly. She took my hand. And never gave it back. That is remarkable. Now... It seems like spooks and high society take up a big part of your lives, but I'm curious, what do you like to do for fun? You're looking at her. <gasps> Frank, I think he means what do we like to drink. Ah, liquor. Oh, speaking of which, um, I've been eyeing this beverage cart of yours, and um, I, I must say this interview has made me very thirsty. Would you be so kind as to, to pour me something from that garden of delights you've got over there? Oh, certainly. We'd be rude guests indeed to not indulge a host's rudeness. That's very good. That's very strong. Now, how often do you do this? Drink? Sure. You might do better to ask how often do we not do this? You've been guzzling this um, almost like a, like the air we breathe. We think of it more as our life's blood. Yes, well, I'll, not to sound like a vampire, but I'll drink to that. Excuse me, I'm not a vampire, by the way. I'm just a public radio uh, interviewer. We can tell. I'm just going to have one more gulp of this. Um, what was my question? Oh, yes. So do you think that if you stopped all this drinking, you'd really be freaked out by all this supernatural business? Stopped drinking? Like went to sleep, you mean? I believe he means if we were to run out of liquor. Oh, well, we have a delivery service. Do you know Ralph Bellamy? A boy who looks like Ralph Bellamy delivers us our groceries. Wait, it's not actually Ralph Bellamy? Who can tell? Not I. Um, any, um, any final thoughts? That's your ending? Good grief, man. It's called showmanship. Well, last month we encountered the ghost of Bernard Pivot, and no offense, he knew his way around an interview. Now watch this. Sadie, what is your favorite word? Doodle. No, uh, flimsy. No, blueberry. No, taxi. Quibble. No. Sadie, think about it. Sure. Drink about it. Sure. I'll have another two, thank you. There you go. Good luck. Favorite word? Dinosaur. What is your least favorite word? Chart. It's fun neither to say nor to see. What turns you on? Franklin Delano Rigby Doyle. <laughs> you already know the answer to that, and I shall not say it on the radio. What turns you off? Making one question into two questions just by asking the opposite of the previous question. Mm, it's just lazy. What sound or noise do you love? A refill. Ah, yes, one of nature's loveliest sounds. No, I'm asking for one, but I suppose it is also my answer. Oh, I'll take another one of those two, thank you. And now, Mr. Torquemada, please continue. What sound or noise do you hate? The sound of lazy questionnaireing. What is your favorite curse word? So many to choose from. For everyone's information, Sadie loves to curse. I do. I curse like a sailor who in his spare time tutors truckers. But what is your very favorite curse word, dear? Do stop pressuring me. They're like my children. It's so difficult to choose. Oh, like everyone does with children, just pick a favorite. Fine. Sh hockey. No, uh, 
Castlevania. Final answer. And for me, you can't go wrong with taco. And yet you've gone wrong. Very well, Sadie. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Chanteurs. Oh, me too, obviously. Now, the big question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? The easy one. Say it with me, Frank. Clink! Frank and Sadie Doyle, thank you so much for being on the program. Go sleep it off. It's all things all considered. I'm Melissa Block. <laughs> He's out. Start the next show. We'll be back with more news later in the hour. <laughs> <laughs>